All right, welcome back. Let's keep trucking along. Testicular torsion. Um, that's when the testicle suddenly rotates on this around the spermatic cord. It cuts off blood supply. This is a medical emergency. You have four to six hours to restore blood flow or the child is gonna lose that testicle. For surgery, basically they just go in and they untwist it and they stitch it back to the side of the scrotum where it belongs. Surgery is usually done bilaterally, even if the torsion only happened on one side, just to prevent future torsion. Um, symptoms are listed for you on your slide. I already talked about the uh, surgery process. It's called a bilateral orchioplexy. It's kind of a fun name to say, an orchioplexy. Um, usually kids are discharged within home after a few hours after surgery, after they wake up and they're eating and tolerated, you know, tolerating fluids okay. Discharge teaching, big here. Pain management, wound and incision care, and then avoid heavy lifting for four weeks, no strenuous activity for two weeks, and again, if it's a child, no riding toys for two weeks also. All right, so now let's talk about nephrotic syndrome. Um, because I will tell you, historically, students tend to get nephrotic syndrome and the uh, acute glomerular nephritis mixed up. So I'm going to really emphasize and hit some points that I think will help you guys be able to keep the two diseases separate. Nephrotic syndrome, characterized by proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, hyperlipidemia, edema, massive edema. Think sumo kids, massive edema and massive urinary protein loss. The picture on your slide shows the sequence of events in nephrotic syndrome. Um, basically what happens is your glomerular membrane, normally impermeable to large proteins, becomes permeable to large proteins, especially albumin. Albumin is lost in the urine, which leads to hyperalbuminuria, so too much albumin in the urine. That's why we end up with hypoalbuminemia, not enough albumin, in the blood. Immunoglobulins are lost, which alters the immunity. The liver gets stressed out and it cannot keep up with the demand for albumin because the kidney just keeps flushing it all out. So you get hypoalbuminemia, not enough albumin in the blood. Fluid starts to shift from the plasma to the interstitial spaces. When the fluid shifts, it causes hypovolemia which stimulates the renin-angiotensin system, resulting in the secretion of ADH and aldosterone. Then the liver is still stressed out, so you get hypercoagul hypercoagulability because of, the changes in the because of the changes in the child's coag factors. The stressed liver starts increasing the synthesis of lipoprotein, which causes the hyperlipidemia. So this is a big, this is a massive change, you know? One little change triggers off this huge, you know, these this huge list of things. All right, so nephronic syndrome can occur as primary disease or it can occur secondary. I listed some other things that nephrotic syndrome is called when it's primary, idiopathic nephrosis, childhood nephrosis, or this minimal change nephrotic syndrome. I think it's just easier just to call it nephrotic syndrome. I just want you to see these other words because sometimes boards likes to play tricks on you guys and call something that you know as nephrotic syndrome something like childhood nephrosis. And you go because it's boards and you're stressed out and you're like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of that in my entire life. Relax, you have. <laughs> um, secondary, um, as the secondary uh, causes, again, as the name indicates, results from some sort of uh, systemic disease, drugs, or toxins that affect kidney function. 85% of children, though, do have the primary nephrotic syndrome. Usually occurs in children ages 2 to 7, and it does involve periods of remission and exacerbation. All right, so nephrotic syndrome, your symptoms are listed for you there. We're looking at massive weight gain, massive edema, generalized edema. Think sumo kids, okay? Does that give you a good image? Also, you can get frothy appearing urine. So the urine's real frothy. It's kind of weird. Massive protein in the urine, um, and you can read through the other labs. Diagnosis is based on, sim on history, symptoms, and lab work. They will do a urinalysis, a serum albumin, serum sodium levels, BUN, cholesterol, and electrolytes. They may do a renal ultrasound, 
which would be done to rule out any kind of structural problems. Treatment focuses on decreasing the proteinuria, relieving the edema, managing associated symptoms, improving nutrition, and infection prevention. Steroids like prednisone will decrease the proteinuria within three weeks. You may have to give albumin and you'll give diuretics to reduce the edema. You'll give ACE inhibitors to decrease the protein excretion and to monitor blood pressure as well. Not monitor, but to decrease it. It is important to monitor electrolyte levels because with diuretics, children can develop hypovolemia and it can alter their electrolyte levels. For children with a massive edema who don't respond to fluid restrictions and diuretics, then they will give albumin and Lasix. All right, so for nephrotic syndrome, your nursing management, what are you going to do? If you are in the hospital and you are caring for a child who has nephrotic syndrome, what in the world do you do for them? Read through all the interventions that are listed on your slide. That's a good start. One of the big things is to monitor for the side effects of steroids and make sure that they are tapered off and not just abruptly ended. Everybody knows not to abruptly end them, but every once in a while somebody has a brain fart and will abruptly end them. So make sure that that doesn't happen. If the child is getting albumin, monitor for fluid volume overload. Also monitor these kids for hypovolemic shock, i.e. you should know the signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock in children. Well, why, why did I say that these children are at risk for developing infection? Because they are on steroids and those suppress your immune system. So if these children are in the hospital, which sometimes they are, then hospitals, as we know, are germ factories. So that is a dangerous, you know, combination right there. If the child, once the children go home, we need to teach the parents to avoid crowded places. These kids don't need to go to the mall. They don't need to go to Walmart. They don't need to go anywhere and everywhere. Make sure that the, uh, to avoid exposure to people who are known to be ill, avoid people who have been recently vaccinated with live vaccines and keep up on the child's vaccination schedule. In the hospital, obviously good hand hygiene, but again, that is like beat into nurses to death. So. All right, so the other big thing I need to talk about is the acute glomerular nephritis. This is a primary event or it can be manifestation of another disorder. So it can be primary or secondary. It is a, considered to be acute because it can sometimes occur after a streptococcal infection. That is important to know. After infection with group A uh, beta hemolytic strep, the latent period is 10 to 21 days. The latent period occurs between when the strep, uh, between the strep infection and the onset of symptoms of the acute post-infectious glomerular nephritis. This is the most common type of inflammation of the glomeruli of the kidneys. It can also be caused though by staph, pneumococcus, and the Coxsackie virus. Acute, the acute hypertension may cause encephalopathy, headaches, nausea, vomiting, lethargy, and seizures. Clinical manifestations. Oliguria, edema, but this is not the massive edema, hypertension, and circulatory congestion. Hematuria, that is a big one to know. Bleeding into the upper urinary tract causes the urine to appear smoky. I guarantee you that's going to be on your exam. Smoky urine. Microscopic hematuria will always be present. Gross hematuria, eh, about 50% of cases. Uh, and then you have protein in the urine. You have increased amount of protein reflects the um, severity of the renal disease. So your pathophysiology. So basically what happens is that child comes down with a strep throat or infection of the upper respiratory tract, skin. They recover. And then 10 to 21 days later, they develop signs of this, this acute glomerular nephritis. Glomerular damage occurs from the antigen antibody complexes that clog up the glomeruli, leading to inflammation and obstruction. So you get these antigen antibody complexes, they just clog up your glomeruli, stop everything up, leads to inflammation, obviously, and then obstruction. Capillaries in the glomeruli are obstructed, so your glomerular filtr filtration rates are going to be decreased. Vascular permeability increases, allowing little red blood cells to seep through and be excreted. 
Sodium and water are retained, expanding the intravascular and interstitial compartments, resulting in some edema. All right, so diagnostics for this. We're going to look for a, we're going to evaluate the serum BUN, the serum creatinine, serum protein, white blood cells, ASO levels vary. If the ASO level is elevated, then that means there are antibodies from a recent strep throat infection. But if the infection was from the skin, then the ASO level probably won't be elevated. That's why I said it can vary. They'll do a UA, um, and what do you think we're going to see there? Hematuria, because we have smoky urine. Protein in the urine, red blood cells, white blood cells. It's going to be gross urine. Treatment, um, INO, vital signs, again, weigh the child daily, bed rest, prevent skin breakdown. These poor kids have to be on a low salt, no added salt diet, which they don't like because a lot of kids like high salt foods. Um, treatment, when you read through these, you know, when you read through on your slides, basically treatment is centered around supportive care. It may appear that the child is anemic, but it is likely due to the dilution from the extracellular volume. So the lab work may show that the child is anemic, but it's really not. It's just it's just it's hemodilution. The edema and the hypertension are going to be treated with sodium restrictions and diuretics. Antibiotics may be given to treat the infection if it hasn't cleared. So what is the big difference in nephrotic syndrome and acute glomerular nephritis? Which one causes massive edema? Nephrotic syndrome. Which one occurs after an infection? Acute glomerular nephritis. All right, hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is a very uncommon illness, and that's a very good thing because this is awful, absolutely awful. Um, basically what happens is children become ill presumably with a GI illness. At least that's what parents and people think. The child has vomiting, diarrhea, um, possibly like a UTI or an upper respiratory infection, and then they appear to recover. Sounds a lot like the acute post-infectious glomerular nephritis, right? Then one to two weeks later, they develop hemolytic uremic syndrome. Presenting symptoms are irritability, fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, mild jaundice, edema, or ascites. If the CNS is affected, um, which is about 20% of cases, you can see seizures and coma. The initial infection, what caused that initial like GI illness, is a very specific strain of E. coli. The E. coli produces a toxin that damages the glomeruli, the collecting ducts and the distal tubules, and the lining of the glomerular arterioles. This leads to acute renal failure. Children will need dialysis and sometimes even a kidney transplant. This absolutely can be fatal to kids. And now it is also associated with the rickettsia organisms, certain uh, other certain viruses. Again, I already talked about that specific strain of E. coli, pneumococci, shigella, salmonella. The source of infection can be from foods or juices too, especially things like unpasteurized, especially apple juice, alfa contaminated alfalfa sprouts, contaminated lettuce, contaminated salami. It can come from drinking water or from swimming pools. So again, this usually affects kids who are less than the age of five. There is a triad of symptoms. Have you noticed between the GI and the GU, we have these like classic triad of symptoms, but you get hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute renal failure. Now, because of the thrombocytopenia, what do you think some of the um, clinical manifestations are gonna be? Thrombocytopenia, we're going to see bruising, petechiae. Um, you, the child may have some bloody diarrhea. They can have oliguria or anuria. And then I already mentioned the jaundice. Um, the hemolytic anemia can cause them to have some pallor too. Treatment is just supportive care. Um, I talked about dialysis or a possible kidney transplant. They will start those these children on um, possibly diuretics, but they will also usually put them on an ACE inhibitor because they're going to have to have something for their blood pressure. 
Nursing care, monitor their labs, monitor their vital signs. There's really not a whole lot you can do. The disease kind of just has to run its course. Pro the prognosis, the recovery rate is 95%, which is good because I said earlier it can be fatal and it can be. Now, kids about 10 to 50%, so that's almost half, half of the kids can have residual long-term renal impairment. So that means their kidneys never fully recover from this and they're going to have some degree of renal impairment. Then you can have long-term complications such as chronic renal failure, hypertension, and CNS disorders in some. Thankfully, this is kind of a rare thing. All right, Wilms tumor or nephroblastoma. These are malignant encapsulated tumors that occur in preschool children. Um, sometimes they are associated with other congenital anomalies such as absent eye irises. It'd be kind of weird to see, wouldn't it? Uh, hemihypertrophy, which is abnormal growth of half of the body. Genitourinary anomalies. Um, nevi and hamartomas, which are like benign nodule-like growths. Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome also. There is some evidence that shows that Wilms tumor is uh, possibly a genetic, um, has a genetic component to it as well. Wilms tumors are a firm lobulated mass, usually on one side of the abdomen. They're oftentimes discovered by the parent when they're bathing their child. There may be some hypertension associated with it since the tumor is located within the kidney. The child may have some pain and some hematuria as well. This is gonna be diagnosed by imaging studies. You should also know these are rapidly growing, doubles in size every 11 to 13 days. That's a lot. All right, so Wilms tumor management. If the child is admitted to the hospital, say pre-op the night before uh, for their surgery to remove the tumor the next day, your nursing alert guarantee you if there's gonna be a peds question about this, it's gonna have something to do with what I'm about to tell you. Never palpate the tumor, ever. Just don't do it. It's tempting, you want to, because we're nurses, but you can't. Surgeons must be extremely careful when removing the tumor because you don't want it to break and release all those cancer cells into the abdomen. For that reason, parents must be very careful handling the child as well. Do not palpate it, nurses. I'm gonna say it again. If a mass is felt, notify the MD and place the child on bed rest until it is evaluated. Because again, we don't want the child to fall down, fall out of bed, do anything that could damage it and cause that Wilms tumor to break open and release cancer cells into the abdomen. Surgery is gonna be scheduled ASAP, usually within 24 to 48 hours of admission to the hospital. Post-op, you're looking at chemo and or radiation. Sometimes that may be done pre-op too, just to reduce the tumor size. Radiation and chemo may follow after surgery as well. However, you should also th consider radiation and chemo can induce secondary cancers, so that's also a risk factor. Wilms tumor can recur, especially in the lungs.